Okay, this video is about part five of uh, Best Christian Art on Literature and Paintings. And we're on page 507, if you're following in the book. And this chapter really is mostly, this last part of the chapter is about Pascal's Wager. I'm going to read through that. Uh, first of all, you know, here's a really nice book, How Catholic Art Saved the Faith. And this was about during the time of the Protestant Reformation. Protestantism is more bookish than Catholicism is. Protestants sort of read the Bible and say, you know, sola scriptura, only the Bible is the words of Martin Luther. And they sort of claim they know the Bible better than the Catholic. And there actually is some truth in the sense that they read the Bible more closely than Catholics do. Catholics is more like something for everybody. Okay, they're not as interested in the saints. They're not as interested in the life of the Virgin Mary and all that maternally stuff. And Catholic is way better for uh, painting and art aesthetically. It's just a lot more pleasing and fun. Sort of, if you look at the lines of Christianity, there's Platonic Christianity going through Augustine, going to Luther and the Protestants. And there's sort of the Aristotelian, Aristotle-related side going through St. Thomas Aquinas to the Renaissance and to Catholicism. So I'm by, you know, my mother is from Puerto Rico, my father's from Ireland, both of them are Roman Catholics. And Catholicism is just... I like it better. It's it's more kind of fun, you know. I don't. I think there's plenty of problems with the church. We've talked about that in other lectures, but aesthetically, it's a lot more pleasing, you know. And I had to go to Catholic school for a while. It was just nice. There were feast days. There were a really good community. There's like almost no community these days because the church is so weak. Uh, so anyway, talk a little bit about the different uh, times in art, the phases of art history. You got classic Greek art like Periclean Greek art, and after the sort of Athens high days, you have Hellenistic Greek art. You got the Roman art. A lot of that they just copied from the Greeks, of course. Um, you got the Middle Ages, sort of the Byzantine symbolic iconographic art, uh, lack of depth perspective, kind of boring. The Middle Ages, more Gothic. Gothic cathedrals are magnificent. Renaissance art, you know, a little bit more humanist, but it's still an intensely religious time. Come on, you know, Savonarola, the bonfire of the vanities and all that. Um, Botticelli, Rogier van der Veen, the two great artists of the 1400s were magnificent. The high Renaissance would be like Michelangelo Sistine Chapel is the ultimate high point of the Renaissance as well as Raphael's School of Athens. Okay, that's high, magnificent, magnificent art, greatest art in the history of the world. Uh, greatest painting in the history of the world is Michelangelo's uh, creation of, uh, of Adam. Okay, then there's the Counter-Reformation. So 1517, Martin Luther nailing the 95 Theses to the wall in the Church of Wittenberg on the cathedral door. And then the Counter-Reformation was the Catholic response to that. Um, and a big part of it was all this art because that's most people are illiterate. They, and, you know, nowadays most people are still functional illiterates. So they would teach people the Christian story through all the paintings in the churches. And they're magnificent, the paintings. There's this holistic art of the architectural uh, buildings, the sculpture, and the paintings. Very beautiful to be inside a Catholic church, especially a good cathedral. Okay, and the Protestants had good music, you know. You know, Martin Luther at least was pro-music. Thank God for that. And he liked, you know, Bach sort of came out of that Lutheran, uh, uh, Lutheran tradition. Um, then there was a so-called enlightenment. They felt they were more enlightened than the earlier religious people, but they did a lot of stupid stuff. The neoclassical uh, art phase included, like, you know, the characteristic uh, artist was Jacques-Louis David. You know, it's painting of Napoleon crossing the Alps, uh, Oath of the Horatii and whatnot. And it's very precise. You know, it's he's a magnificent artist. Um, in response to that, there was romanticism. You know, there was also the Rococo, which is sort of like, you know, a soft form of art. But there was romanticism, which is much more emotional, much more individualistic. Things like uh, Caspar David Friedrich, for example. Um, and then I love the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. That's the painting of the mid-1800s and later. And they sort of came out of the school uh, John Everett Millay and uh, John Ruskin promoted them. And um, magnificent speech. I had it somewhere on one of my videos, the John Ruskin 1853 speech. It's magnificent. More realism. Um, and their disciples came out of there too, like uh, Edmund Leighton, for example. It's just magnificent. One of the greatest artists of all time. And then Impressionism still had something good about it. But then modern crap, it's all fake. It's all bad. It's all a joke. It's all an insult 
to these artistic traditions. Okay, I'm now going to just do uh, Pascal's Wager because uh, it's a real key moment it's sort of in Christian history and Christian literature here. So here's Pascal. He was a great uh, mathematical genius, invented the first version of a computer or a math adding machine, and he was also a philosopher. He's very used to calculating risk for gambling as well. So here's what Pascal writes. What would you want to be true? Pas okay, what if there was a bet? with the possibility of infinite gain and with no risk of loss? What if there was another bet with the possibility of infinite loss and no hope of gain? That would be the most interesting wager you could have. That is the reality of religion. God either exists or God does not exist. If you wager your life that God does not exist and he does, then you lose everything. If you wager your life that God exists and he doesn't, you lose nothing. If you wager your life that God does exist, and he does, then you gain everything. If there is one wager you should want to be able to make, it is on God. This is not a proof of God, but it is an incitement to want to know. But knowledge of God without knowledge of Christ is absolutely insufficient, because the world would still make no sense to us. Okay. Imagine that God created a world just as Descartes described. So what? There is still the misery of man, the contradictions, the absurdities of life, incomprehensible to us, that the world had a creator. Fine, but so what? What does it solve? What does it answer for you? Without the knowledge of Christ, knowledge of God is a barren, philosophical doctrine about a first cause, irrelevant and unimportant to human life. But faith and Christian revelation change everything. There are arguments, but they won't convince you, because one does not believe in Christ through the mind. One believes in Christ through the heart. There were miracles, there were prophecies fulfilled, but those won't tempt you at all, because the mind rejects what's good, and the will rejects what's good. But if one is touched in one's heart by grace, the heart has its reasons, which reason knows not. And the world finds it absurd that a Christian believes by faith and grace. But here is what happens. Have you ever looked at a trick picture? And you look at it, and then you look at it some more and it looks like one thing. But then you change your perspective on it and you look at it from a different angle and you realize that it is a picture of something else. That is what Christian faith accomplishes. When you understand the full, you understand the absurdity, the misery, and the dualism of human life. You understand how we are a combination of the exalted and the debased. When you understand the sacrifice, the crucifixion, the blood, the grace of Christ, then, th then that there is a God and that this world merited by his love that surpasses all understanding. It makes sense of that world which formerly was incomprehensible. With faith, our contradictions and unhappiness, our greatness and depravity all fall into place. Not physics, not barometrics, not philosophy, none of these things are the goal of life. Inner peace and salvation are the goals of life, and those are matters of grace, the heart, and the Christian faith. So that's Pascal from Ponce, it's from Thoughts, from he wrote in between his life was 1623 to 1662. So pretty extraordinary stuff. Okay, and that concludes our chapter on uh, literature uh, of art in Christianity.